Greetings, welcome, welcome to all friends, families, um, supporters, and enemies. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very pivotal course that we are honored to share with you, and we hope we will that it contextualizes a very important understanding of the love dynamic. Welcome to Decolonize Your Love, Revitalizing the True Nature of Your Relationships Through the beliefs, values, and practices of autochthonous culture. We are Nawasha Idu. And Mansho Idu. And we use the art and science of Black love culture to help you decolonize your love and create the relationship of your wildest dreams. So we're a happily married soulmate team, co-parents, co-friends, uh, the besties <laughs> of the besties. But um, we're the co-founders and co-directors of the Acoma House Initiative, a culturally based counseling and consulting firm that's recognized internationally. And we're very proud of that. We're also the creators of Acoma Day, the cultural alternative to Valentine's Day that's currently celebrated in 14 countries. We're also authors of three best-selling books, and we are also the creators of the Black Love School. Yes. And you may have found us through one of those things, one of our books, Acoma Day or the Black Love School. Um, the Black Love School is an online portal that unifies the global Black community around the philosophies and methods of harmoniously healthy Black love. So we want to get into this whole concept. And when we talk about decolonizing your love or any term or word that we bring into the social environment, we want to be specific about what we're talking about. In this social media era, it's a lot of jargon, meaningless jargon being thrown around. And so people get lost. But when we say decolonizing your love, we're talking about the process of reversing the mental, linguistic, and behavioral oppression that permeates our intimate relationships. While revitalizing our true nature through the beliefs, values, and practices of indigenous or what we would call autochthonous culture. As the parent people of humanity, it's critical for black people to reclaim the symbolism, the ritual, and ceremony of holistically healthy divine love. So we're going to talk about a lot of things in this mm -hmm. class. So you want to get comfortable, maybe, you know, take out a pen or some paper, lock journal. In. Yes, lock in because we're just going to go over um, how we are in the situation that we're in when it comes to divine love. So we're starting off the conversation by just talking about the diaspora. Uh, we are definitely saying that Africa is a recent home for black people, but black people have gone throughout the world from Africa in many different ways. And we've also, as Mancho said, we're the parent people of humanity. So we're talking about the African diaspora. We're gonna use a lot of different words in this presentation, and hopefully we will um, make reference and, and define all of the words, but we just wanna let you know that we're speaking about black people and where we are all over the planet. So what exactly is culture? Here we have the definition of culture to make sure that we are on the same page because a lot of times we think that culture is just the way that we talk or the language that we speak or our clothes, our art, our music, our food. But truthfully, all of those things actually come from a group value system. So we have culture as being that group value system of independent core beliefs that manifest as the thought, speech, and action, symbol creation and recognition, sensory perception, emotional response, logic progression, and formulaic presentation that is manifested repeatedly through the 11 areas of people activity. And we're using those 11 areas that Dr. Neely Fuller and Dr. Francis Chris Wellsing gave us as the um, economics, education, entertainment, food, fashion, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So when we talk about the art and science of black love culture, you know, again, we can define art, we can define science, we can define black <laughs> love and culture. But 
in the intimate relationship, it's a lot of whimsy and a lot of confusion around this word love. I hear a lot of different things where there's a trend now among a lot of black people who say love has nothing to do with emotion or love has nothing to do with feeling. And I find that very interesting. They're, they're striving to assert that love is about generational wealth and things of that nature. And that is a part of love. But I, I don't think that to um, really define love, we don't have to cut off one uh, function of the definition and highlight another. I think we get into trouble when we do that because I think that love is holistic and it's perpetual. And so we say that love is a holistic and perpetual consciousness characterized by an intense emotional affinity to understand and unify with complementary people, places, and things in a reciprocal energy exchange of thought, speech, and action. And so that really encapsulates from a cultural standpoint what love is. I think that there are a lot of Black people afoot today trying to rebalance an imbalanced um, definition of love, but they're actually imbalancing it in the other direction. And so we don't want imbalance to the right or to the left, to the front, to the back, from the inner to the outer, or from the under or the over. We want holism. And so we are using this sphere image to show the vibratory um, resonance that the circle is the symbol that best represents social equality. And love definitely deals with that equality. So it's a holistic consciousness and it is based on an emotional affinity, but it is also to have complementary energy, reciprocal energy exchange, which I think a lot of people are talking about when they're saying all of a sudden now, love has nothing to do, um, or marriage has nothing to do with love, or love is not about emotion. And, you know, that's incomplete. We want to be holistic in our definition. And even, you know, looking at this graphic, I think where we have a lot of challenges is where the love overlaps. So I know a lot of us are into physical love. <laughs> and that is everything from, you know, just being around a person, sex definitely falls into that category. But we are making our way during this class into understanding what it means to have autochthonous culture and be able to celebrate and live your culture before the frame of colonialism. So really expanding beyond the physical into, you know, an emotional kind of love, even when you're having sex, right? That the emotion is still there. But then even expanding yes, <laughs> expanding beyond that too to include what we knew as the practice of love. So really being able to grow beyond where we are right now. And truthfully, it's really a remembering and a growing, carrying it into the future. So when we talk about the elements of holistic love culture, it's important. So again, we're saying holism and it's not just fluff. We're talking about indigenous thought. We're talking about causal thought. We're talking about systemic thought. We're talking about linear thought. We're talking about systems thought. We're holistic in this approach. And so in holistic love culture, you have symbolism, ritual, language, ceremony, holistic health, fellowship, and service. These are the things that make up love culture without these things being equally balanced or bringing us to a pinnacle point as we see this Merkut, these three Merkuts that overlap each other to create three more or four more Merkuts within the one. <laughs> so we see the multiplicity in the individuality. But when we say love culture, this is what we're talking about. What are these other people talking about? <laughs> so this is actually what we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into. So we're starting out with symbolism. And symbolism when it comes to love is extremely important, right? Because this is what where we are going to have our abstract ideas represented. So this is before words, right? These are some of the symbols that we think of 
and that we use when it comes to love. So that first symbol um, was the farmer's till. Our ancient ancestors used that as a symbol, of, an ancient symbol of love in the Hopi Nile Valley to represent the cultivation process that you have to use when you cultivate the land is identical to the way you cultivate a love relationship. There's a seeding, there's a planting, there's a nurturing and then a harvesting. Um, but here we look at some of the popular symbolism around love culture. We have what is commonly called the heart, <laughs> which is a misnomer, but we have um, the Eiffel Tower in um, Paris. And <clears throat> um, I think that it's uh, referenced as one of the symbols of Western love. We have the Greek goddess Aphrodite. And then I think the most common practical one that's used definitely in the commercialism of love culture in the West is Cupid, the little naked cherubim boy who um, people have a misunderstanding or a partial understanding of his story. But these are some of the common symbols that when you walk up to most people who are um, European or colonized by European or under that influence, these are some of the things that you get. I want to go to Paris. It, um, I want to go to Rome or I want to go, you know, I want to be beautiful like Aphrodite or I want to be struck by Cupid. I think that Cupid probably has more songs than any <laughs> mythical creature that exists. Um, reference more times. And, and I think even little children who may not know Aphrodite, um, we don't see naked white women that much coming out of a seashell. But we see Cupid, <laughs> just as strange as that is, you got Cupid flying around shooting people with two arrows, one of love and one of hate, which people don't talk about much. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand that part of Cupid's story, that you can get struck by an arrow to love someone that you wouldn't actually love, right? Or you can get struck by the arrow to hate someone that you wouldn't normally hate. So this is why I think that they make him the little boy like mm -hmm. as you know playing to the mis mischievous little boy as you mm -hmm. just said but i think it's something that we don't really even bother to look into the full story because we're just presented with something again that's outside of our cultural reference so and we get it so young um, most little children can say that this is cupid because they've celebrated valentine's day before but when we look culturally at symbolism we start to see things from a more holistic view. Um, one of the first things that I always recognize when we talk about indigenous black culture is that the focus is always on an endearing love for the feminine principle. All the way, the hierarchy goes all the way into the creative force. In fact, from my research, African cultures, indigenous pre-colonialized African cultures are the only cultures that have the concept mother, father, God. We don't have a father God that appeared out of nowhere. We had the mother and father God that emanates simultaneously. And I think that's a very, very um, beautiful and more correct and balanced holistic. You know, again, we have some um, segment arguers who say, it's a man, no, it's a woman, no, it's a man, no, it's a woman. African culture says it's both. And, and, I, and I believe that that's more correct. I think that is correct, um, absolutely correct. But here we see the symbolism of, instead of Aphrodite, or I shouldn't say instead of, but predating Aphrodite is Het Heru, which is the Net Heru in the, in the Hopi Nile Valley system of beauty, love, and all of those things associated with the loving energy of uh, uh, a woman. And um, you see her here in this depiction with the um, cow's horns atop her head as a symbol of the great mother that grazes the universal earth. And with the sun disc Ra or Ray in her, in between her horns, that represents the, the source of life. Certainly our mothers are the source of all of our lives. And so I find this, um, very, very uh, appropriate. And she's very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, then in the center, we have the Merkuts, which is the original name of 
the structures that are commonly miscalled the pyramids. And pyra, pyra is a Greek word that means fire. So the pyramid is a house of fire, but merkut is, means house of love. And that's an indigenous name to the people who created it. When you look at it as the house of love, it takes on so much more grandiose meaning and it's so much more appropriate because as we talked about before, the labor to build such amazing structures being the only one of the original seven world wonders still standing on the earth speaks for itself. There are no uh, structures on earth like these Merkut in these, these, these three main ones in uh, Giza. Then right beneath we see the um, a depiction of the goddess Ma'at with the feather, the plume feather of the ostrich on her head that represents balance, harmony, um, justice, propriety, reciprocity. Um, we have the seven virtues, the 10 principles and the 42 laws of Ma'at, originally 247 laws downgraded to, to 42, which is the moral ethical code of our people of ancient times and everywhere you go the thing that identifies african people more than anything when they're in their indigenous uncolonized state in my opinion is their high moral ethical code and so my eye is the symbolism and representation of that finally we have here um the akoma which is the proper name of the symbol that we continue to miscall the heart. It is the Akoma is a word that comes from Ghana, West Africa and is represented as an Adinkra symbol, but this shape exists in nature. And like the, um, the people in Ghana say, the Adinkra came with them. This has no birth record. It represents the sacred science of soul mating in its imagery. And we get into that later, but you will notice that it's in perfect symmetry the way our relationships and the way we need to relate to one another. So the next area that we're gonna go a little deeper into is language. And this is really important because for people who are healing from being colonized and in an effort to decolonize, it's really important what language we're speaking because for us, it's it's gonna be a challenge to express original thought in a colonized language. And this is something that we have to accommodate for when we're speaking English, French, Spanish, any of these languages that are not our own, especially when our original language was removed as we are forced to learn the colonized language. So when we look at love culture, the word that must go, <laughs> absolutely must go is the word romantic because when we say this word there's a lot of levels to the psychosis of black people using this word first of all it negates the fact that for thousands of years before there was a Rome there were hundreds of love poems love words love monuments love stories love symbolisms that existed all throughout the diaspora of the world where African people po uh, populated, pollinated and populated. <laughs> <laughs> so when we say romantic, we're, it's very much like saying, this is the year 2000 and something when we have buildings that are older than 2000 years old. It just erases your actual history and subscribes you and locks you into the history of a particular people. Now, what's so devastating about that is that's not complete and it's not factual, but it's also insane when you consider the people that you're locking yourself into are your historical oppressors. Rome's um, expedition into Africa and its conquering um, from Caesar to many others has been horrendous. And then when we look at Roman culture and, and its demonstration of quote unquote love historically as written by 
Greek and Roman writers, not even what I'm saying, is not something, it's Hellenic, it's hell. <laughs> it's not something that you would um, subscribe to, but because you are being oppressed by a people who are um, around you and about you, you're taking on, it's, it's, it's the most um, psychotic version of Stockholm Syndrome. You're identifying with your oppressor, even in your oppressor's absence. You're not from Rome, and, and, and even considering that the first Romans may have been black or, or historically were black, um, it's irrelevant. Rome's history has always been theft to Africa. If you look at this this bottom right picture of a bottom left picture of St. Peter's Square, you will see the Tekenu or obelisk that was actually stolen from Egypt, stolen from Kemet, stolen from Tanahisi, the um the um beloved land of our ancestors, and it sits there and they do rituals and, and all kind of things every week with the Pope with stolen property sitting right in the center of their, their rituals. So we don't ascribe to be romantic. And this is really a chin check for black people around the world. You have to courage up. You have to educate yourself and become aware of the fact that what you're saying is treasonous to your ancestors and it will keep you in a psychotic love flux by calling yourself under the name of your oppressors, it would be the equivalent of a Jewish person saying um, to describe their intimate love, I'm Nazietic. That's insane. So <laughs> there's options. There are options. So really what you know we, we have to expand into is that there were words to describe the pinnacle of intimate love. And because we are speaking English, and not only because we're speaking in English, but because we're holding our the last um, ruling culture as Rome, this is where we're going to say that the epitome of love is romantic, right? So in order to replace that, a lot of people have a hard time with what word to even use to replace it. So there are options. Now, we sometimes say meritic, which is, you know, this combination in a way of using mer and English. Mm -hmm. um, but you, if you speak, if you're looking to speak any original language, the idea is, again, following symbolism as your concept in an abstract way. You're coming down to now really making language for those abstract ideas. And of course, the first people to have ideas of love, ideas of intimate love, ideas of soul mating are the original people on the planet. So that can be um, key Swahili that you go to. We are using the Akoma and the, um, you know, from Ghana. So there are so many choices that you can use to express that. And even I say, even if you're just speaking English, like I'm speaking English right now, um, you can find a more intentional way to talk about intimate love, which is why we also say, divine love. So really just bringing more intention to our language is extremely important because we want to express what we actually mean. We want to say what we actually mean and we want to understand <laughs> what someone else is saying or what they're actually meaning, right, by what we say. And this is a challenge sometimes, especially if you don't speak two or three languages because you're we're limited by the language that we speak, right? Like even some of your, what you know to be true, what you know as existence, everything that we have decided to label, if you only know one way of labeling, it can sometimes be a challenge to think beyond that because what you're called to do is go back to the symbolism or go back to the abstract idea and not just rely on the letters or you know the decoding of words. And so that's very important because there are a multitude of um, words that we use to describe love throughout the continent, Zamunye, Mpenzi. Um, we talked about uh, Idu mm -hmm. actually means love, our last True. name. Um, <laughs> so there's a, there's a multitude of names that we, can, that we can use and we should immediately get busy and um, purge ourselves from this romantic word 
and begin to cultivate words that reflect our sanity and our culture. Speaking of word purge, <laughs> there are other, you know, phrases also. So a lot of times we say we're falling in love because we don't really think about what that means. But typically when we're falling, it's not a good thing. <laughs> so a lot of times we say, oh, you know, I fell in love. I fell out of love. I'm falling in love. I'm falling out of love. Like we don't have control. But when we know we're consciously creating a relationship, and we're looking for divine love again, we want to be able to say what we actually mean. So you can say, I'm building in love, I'm rising in love, but there are so many other things to use to be able to really express your true intention without saying that you don't have any control over who you love. Right, because everywhere in English where we use the word falling, stocks falling, <laughs> prices falling, Prices falling might not be a bad one, but <laughs> it depends on what vantage point you're coming from. From the seller, prices falling is a is a bad thing. <laughs> so almost everywhere that we use the term falling, it, it denotes helplessness. It denotes um, a loss of some kind. Um, in rising, there is a power in things rising. There is a pride in things rising. There's a gratitude in things rising. And there's definitely an intention because anything that rises goes against the magnetic pull that we call gravity. And it is awesome in that way that it, it is um, showing itself to be superior at that moment in time to those uh, gravitational or magnetic pull. So rising in love or building in love is a much better descriptive term than I tripped and foot fell. Because I noticed that people often say, you can't help who you fall in love with or almost as if it's like, you know, stepping in dung or something like <laughs> it, it's totally not in your um, control, but nobody builds something that they don't plan. Or nobody rises in, in a way that isn't intentional. So that's just a, a, a simple example of the way we have to change what we're actually saying to ourselves first and then to each other. Right. So it takes a level of awareness because this is why we say it's a word purge, but then also a word cultivation because you're removing certain things that you may have just taken for granted as expressions that mean something other than what they actually mean. And then you're making a conscious choice, as Masha was saying, to be empowered by the phrases that she used. So when we look at this really, I think this is really a profound point. We're looking at this beautiful graphic gives us the most spoken languages in the world. And when we look at the languages, they actually, um, rank in order as uh, Chinese, Spanish, English, Hindi, Arabic, Bengali, Portuguese, Russian, Japanese, Landa, and French would have made that uh, list if it was spoken as a second language. Really, really interesting, right? Now, if you look at this map, where you see everywhere these languages are, there are essentially black and brown people in these places. So if we look at Africa, let's start here, where we see Arabic and Portuguese, right? There's 790 million African people on the African continent. When we look at somewhere like Brazil, it is the largest de um, um, uh, porting of African people outside of the African continent. Of course, we know America is, so there's like 60 million people, 60 million black people in Brazil. So they say there's 40 million black people in the United States of America. Um, but then we also have India where a extremely large amount of black skinned people who um, are oftentimes described as being not black. 
because they're not from the African continent, as it said, but I've talked to many wise elders from Indian culture and they say that the, all the original gods in Hinduism are actually black because it's a reminder that they came from Africa. All of the phenotypes that you see in India from the hair and various different things we can find in the Nubian people and all different people. There's, you know, as uh, Nemo uh, Ostraquasi would say, there's no one prototype that defines an African characteristic. So African people or black people have all kinds of skin types, all kinds of hair types, nose, lips, etc. Anything that you see that actually exists in human beings, black people are the progenitors of that. And that's, that's, you know, that's irrefutable. So you can argue with that, but it can be proven in very little matter of time. So when we understand that, it is absolutely amazing that these are the 10 languages that are speaking. And now, Bengali, Hindi, I'm going to say, I'm going to give them to a pass. And even Punjabi. But these other group of languages? Yeah, what, what I think is really interesting. Have nothing to do with us. <laughs> because I do speak Portuguese. But when you see that Portuguese is also, you know, spoken well, first, it's if you see where Portugal is, <laughs> right, right. there's a lot of Portuguese spoken outside of Portugal. And I think that when it comes to English, Spanish and Portuguese, those are really interesting things because I have a I have uh, I, I speak a little bit of Spanish. Excuse me, but I do speak Portuguese and I speak English. So when you see where Portugal really is on the map <laughs> and then you're like, wow, you know, millions of people speak Portuguese. So 220 million people. And it is in Angola and Mozambique and Brazil and Capo Verde or Cape, Cape Verde. You know, like these ideas of a colonized language being someone's native language that's not from Portugal. And this is really like, so these are, you know, there's millions and mil hundreds of millions of people as their first language speaking a colonized language. And this is really a challenge because when that happens, your abstract ideas are taken from you. They're lost to you in a way. Even sometimes in the reclaiming of a language, there's a stretch, especially if you are an adult learning a language, right? It comes easier when you're a child and you're going from abstract idea to multiple languages at a time. Some people have a have a okay time learning 10, 15, 20 languages, but a lot of adults struggle with it right. because the idea of um, learning the new language becomes a, a, a like a measure of translating, which is another kind of decoding. <laughs> so I knew I was fluent in Portuguese when I started to have dreams in Portuguese. But before that time, it was very much, uh, I want to say book, how do I say book in English and let me translate that book to Portuguese because that was my reference, right? Until I really said, okay, now I'm fluid. Then it was, I can think and dream and dance and have abstract ideas in this language, but to not be able to do that in, an, in your any original indigenous language, it takes away some of the abstract ideas and some of the concepts because everything, and you know this if you speak a language, everything doesn't exactly translate, right? This is why it's someone's job <laughs> to be an interpreter because you have to actually interpret the mood, the tone, and those abstract ideas. So this is something that I think is very interesting as we talk about word purge and word cultivation is right. how many millions is into the hundreds of millions of people who are speaking a colonized language as their native language, but also you know, for us that are speaking English, um, English would be the second most spoken language in the world after Chinese. And this is again because of the political and power structure of the United States, really. So the cultural export, the business, you know, it still makes sense to speak English <laughs> for, the, for a lot of people. So there's almost a billion people speaking English as a second language, if you include us, you know, native speakers and all of the people who speak English as their second or third language. So this is still, again, what we're saying is this is what's dominant. And although we sometimes believe that 
being colonized is a thing of the past. It's in situations like this that we realize the remnants of colonization and how you know, challenging it can be to decolonize when there's not just a ready-made option to switch out. It's really a process of returning to your indigenous self. When you consider that black people brought language to the world, the 12 original languages divided into multiplicity, all of these languages technically can have their root in some African language. We're aware of that. Um, you know, many argue about the origins of Arabic, um, Alexander Pushkin in Russian, um, you know, so we, you know, the point is, is that today there is 1 billion, 8 million black people on the face of this earth. And when we look at the numbers of the top, the number one language spoken in the world by one in six people on earth is Chinese. And that's 1.3 billion people. Now, there's more black people on earth than that. I'm not suggesting that we should be monolithic in that we should all be speaking one language. In our current condition, that is actually an intelligent strategy. And you know what's interesting? That's how it is in, in Japan. Yeah. Like, so for a large, for the Japanese making this list, right? they don't have other people speaking Japanese for the most part. So right. there is a population of Japanese people in, in uh, Brazil and of course in the United States. But as a whole, when you're looking at, you know, China or Japan, what you're looking at is uh, millions of people in a collective in a location speaking a language, right. as opposed to when you're looking at Portugal and then realizing that more people speak Portuguese in Brazil than they do in Portugal. Right. That is that's that's really deep. the effects of colonization. Like, and it's the same in in, in um, Spanish in, too. In in Spanish and English in America, black people in America, you know, I encourage you to really look at the size of England and look at the size of America and look at how crazy it is for all of these black people to speak English as their only language, and will get indignant. If certain people start speaking another language around them, <laughs> it become threatened as if they're somehow English is their native language. Now, we can laugh at this, but this is very it real is. because really when you is. look at how deep this is, this suggests that you cannot even dream in a language outside of your oppressor, as Nawasha was saying. You cannot think. Right. And when the, the 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 language of any people is a reflection of their thought symbols. So it was scientific to take away the language of a people as one of the primary ways to colonize them because when you give them the language that is your language and you force it on them as theirs, they can't eat speaking that language, they can't even think outside of the realm the circumference of your rule, that is very profound. Mm -hmm. So that alone should yeah, encourage us. Tactic. That is definitely a war tactic. That alone should encourage us to adopt the language. And I think it was uh, Baba Kaba or Baba Smalls who said, all black people should learn Kiswahili as a practical and commerce language. And then we should learn Medu Netter as a classical language. So we should speak Medu Netter in our spiritual and higher cultural pursuits historically, but then on an everyday level, all black people on the earth should pick up today and start learning Kiswahili. And there's many, many, many things. Rosetta Stone, which is named after the Stella that was found in the Nile Valley and ascribed to a, a, a white person named Rosetta, how arrogant that is is a tool that's out there for black people to, you know, on your downtime, you should be learning Kiswahili. And we're committing to that this year. We speak a little bit of Medu Netter. Nawasha is definitely um, fluent in Portuguese over the last 30 years, um, last like 25 years or so. We've been definitely speaking uh, Medu Netter for the last you know, for the entirety of our relationship, one of the initiations that we um, receive. But 
we're not fluent in it. So we know a couple hundred words, but it's one of the most expansive languages that exists. So that's like really knowing maybe like 1%, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if that, <laughs> um, of what it could be. So we have some work to do there, but I'm challenging, I'm, accept, I'm challenging us, all of us as black people, including Nawasha and I and our family to begin to develop um, an understanding and a practical usage of Kiswahili as well as um, another African language, which I would suggest Medunetta, but whatever you, you know, um, whatever you learn is fine for you because many Africans on the continent already speak different languages. So add two more. This way we can speak to each other on a, on a universal um, plane, but also for ourselves, for those of us who don't already speak an indigenous uh, African language, what it can help us do is literally the vibratory resonance of sound and, and sound therapy. We can heal our minds and our hearts using authentic language. And this is something that's not being taught. What we're being taught is to become fluent in, I remember Chinese. when I was in school, in the 80s in high school, they said that if you didn't learn Spanish, you would not be able to survive in, in the next 20 years. In fact, the whole world would be speaking Spanish, one of my teachers said. And I was like, the whole world would be speaking Spanish? <laughs> like, why? Well, but hey, Spanish is number two on yeah. this top 10 list. So yeah, just like but, now people are saying you should go learn Chinese because it's number one. That's not the reason to learn the language. Right, right. <laughs> right. What, I'm, what I'm suggesting, though, is that that instruction was whether the teacher knew it consciously or it was just an unknowing mechanism of the system that she was, you know, the pedagogy she was teaching under, it was a lie used to control um, the people that were the American people who would be under the control of whatever the um, economic whims were of the power structure. Black people don't need to have, know Spanish or Portuguese or any of these other languages to survive if we have our own agenda and we have our own power base to interact with each other. So now we have made it to ritual, one of the major areas of love interaction, right? We have a lot of love rituals that we um, think of in our different relationships from the casual love, like friendship, you know, handshaking, kissing, when you greet, all the way to the more intimate rituals in your divine partnership or your soulmate relationship. But these are also things that we need to have a, a deeper look into to help decolonize. And this is me getting my feet washed. <laughs> <laughs> yes, those are Masho's toes <laughs> featured. Um, so some of the modern love rituals include giving flowers that have been cut, you know, going out on dates, proposing on one knee, consulting a woman's family before you get married. Um, but a lot of those practices have turned into kind of like a uh, hollow or incomplete gestures. And we really don't have the deeper level of insight into why we're doing something. And we're also not really um, bringing the intention with us when we're just modeling things that we have seen. Our indigenous rituals are including spirit, right? They're the communal rituals that sometimes are large, like celebrating holidays or having those marriage ceremonies, but they're also the individual rituals, which we call the maintenance rituals. And indigenous ritual bridges the gap between what is seen and what is unseen. So this is where we're able to use the elemental forces like earth, water, air, and fire, and all of our senses. So thought, um, emotion, sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. But this always has an invitation to the, spirit, the spiritual and the ancestral realm. So next we look at ceremony. And ceremony is the unified gathering for a specific event. It, it would be um, uh, a, a variation or it, it's very similar to a ritual in one way, but it's a specific way that we are honoring a specific thing as a unified group. 
And right here, you see a picture of Nawash and I <laughs> conducting one of the many marriage ceremonies that we have done. Um, a doctorian um, and, and um, attorney, Diane, um, that we did, Esquire, yeah. Esquire yeah. Diane, <laughs> that we did it, uh, from Brooklyn, New York. And um, they, they're they beautiful, um, one of the most, probably the most beautiful wedding that we've ever done. Um, amazing. But when we think of ceremony, I think, especially when it comes to love, um, this is the ceremony that most people think of, the marriage ceremony or the wedding. It's not even the marriage ceremony. It's the wedding ceremony. Um, we make clear distinction between wedding and marriage because I always say that at a wedding is a bride and groom, but in a marriage is a husband and wife. And there are <laughs> different things distinctly. Um, the ceremony is a temporal event. And this is unfortunately how we look at love as an event instead mm -hmm. of a journey where the husband and wife, the marriage is a journey, but the uh, wedding is a ceremony. And we have a lot of ceremonies in our culture. This is like the, you know, the formal way that we're gathering to mark these transitions in our life. So it can be the wedding ceremony. It can be, you know, the baby showers, which are intended to be the welcoming of the child, but sometimes that is absent, right, in our present um, reality. Definitely the crossing in education and then the crossing back into an ancestral realm. So this, the life cycle that we are living, we're marking it with different ceremonies. And this is as it should be. In every culture, this happens. It just happens in different ways. What's happening with us, again, as, you know, having an effect from colonization is that we don't have ritual included a lot of time. So some of the time that we're thinking that we're having a ritual or we do certain things, we don't even know why we do them, like jump the broom or, you know, like invite our friends and family to a um, baby shower or even have a processional, you know, at a graduation, we are going along, we're going with the flow, <laughs> but we don't understand why we wear the colors that we wear, why we do the things that we do in a certain order. And a lot of times things are, we're left with an empty uh, feeling because we don't have the deeper connection to ritual. So that, that inclusion of where ceremony and ritual overlap. It's very important for us to recognize that, to bring the ritual to ceremony and even to, you know, ritualize our life. So some of the smaller things, like we said, like waking up in the morning with the person that you love, greeting them can definitely be a ritual because this is where we said the seven senses, but this is where you really include the mind and the heart. So as an aligned way of still interpreting the life, interpreting existence, thought and emotion are the first two senses. And sometimes we're going through the ceremony, like Mancho said, you know, we're having a wedding because we think we should, but we're not necessarily aligning the fact that the people who are at our wedding are supposed to be helping us through our marriage. And there's sometimes this kind of conversation of separating the mind and the heart or, you know, being led by the mind instead of the heart. And the truth is that we have both for a reason. <laughs> we need both. And the mind has emotional aspects to it, right? So even when we're thinking it's not absent of emotion, I let people know that all the time when we are, you know, counseling and speaking and teaching that some of the decisions that you think you're making that are so, quote, logical are really based on your history and what you feel about that history or based on your desire for the, you know, a future and what you actually feel about that. Even when it comes time to just like, what are we about to eat tonight? <laughs> Some of that is, what do you want to eat? What do you have a taste for? It's not necessarily like, um, if it was just about logic, we'd be just, you know, taking a shot of wheatgrass sometimes. <laughs> if it was really about what's best for our body right now at this time, <laughs> excuse me, and what's the, you know, the easiest thing for us to do or the most harmonizing thing for us to ingest. And that's not it. But a lot of times we have, again, 
because of colonization, we have a negative connotation to emotion because it also comes with a feminine representation many times, or so we've been told, right? Yes. That emotion is, is feminine. And because of that, we take a tone that a lot of the things that we're doing, we can take the heart out of it. We can take the emotion out of it. We can take, you know, it's not a, um, a coma based practice, but for your life, we need to balance and bring into harmony the heart and the mind, you know, that emotional self and mental self. I always laugh when I hear men say, black men say, listen, brother, we have to take emotion out of it. If we're going to look at this, we got to take emotion out. And I'm always struck by the more they say it, the more emotional they get. <laughs> it's hilarious. But again, as we <laughs> talked about at the beginning, we, we don't correct ourselves sometimes in our dysfunction. We overcorrect to our own detriment. We don't want to eliminate emotion because that's the gas of the system. We want to uh, balance emotion with our intellect, with our rationale, with our formulaic um, expression, with our um, logic progression. We don't want to eliminate it. We want to balance it because when we balance it, We'll have the drive and the technique. We'll have the why and the how. We'll be holistic in our approach. So I encourage all black men to balance yourself and stop saying for those of you who do, let's take emotion out of it to be effective. That's incorrect. And that brings us directly to living a holistic life, right? And having holistic health. And this is something that is extremely important for our relationships because yes. of the way we're interconnected and the way we overlap. So this is vital to us returning to uh, an a aligned way of being in divine love. I think it's amazing that when we look at holistic health um, and we talk about the health of our body, here in the West, in America, in the Western world where we live in America, the number one cause of death is um, heart attacks. And I think that it's interesting that it's not some other kind of dis-ease, but it's something that is related to your heart. And I think, wow, how appropriate for the work that we do, because this becomes a teaching moment for us to really delve deep into what is it that is poisoning the heart? When we look at heart disease, when we look at heart failure, when we look at heart attacks, what we're seeing is a self poisoning. Um, we're seeing that um, auto intoxication is the source of hearts. Like it's not like, you know, hearts are like they break down at a certain amount of time after you got them from birth. Is that we are destroying our own hearts. In essence, we are breaking our own hearts. And I think that that is very profound to where we are as a people, as we have the conversation around love culture. Um, we're talking about a people who are love starved, a people who are love lost, a people who are love confused, and a people who are love destructive are breaking their own hearts and it's the number one killer of people in our country. That's really profound. It is, it is because every, at a deeper level again, the way that we understand our body to be, our organs to be, the heart, the reason why it was uh, weighed in the judgment scene against a feather, right, is because it was the seat of the soul. So when you see that there is a, an area or a group of people who are suffering from something that has to do with their personality, like you're saying, you know, like you're, you're poisoning yourself, there is not a major push for us to heal that really at, at a group level, at a national level. And the reason is because this becomes a pacification for us to self-soothe, you know, the, the diet choices that we have, the lifestyle that we have is not aligned. So a lot of times we will be maybe focused on the physical and we might work out or we might get, you know, some type of 
reconstructive surgery to change the way that we look physically, but we're not dealing with the emotional part of ourselves and we're not dealing with the mental part of ourselves. And there is a, you know, a major conversation about mental health happening right now in our community, in the Black diaspora. So I'm really happy to see that. But again, it really comes back to having a holistic life because we are not segmented like this. So we can focus on our heart or we can focus on our hands, you know, our hair. We can focus on our mind. But the truth is, it's all about bringing everything into holism, alignment, and realizing that we are not disjointed like this. So bringing able or being able to bring this into a conversation about divine love is extremely important. Because when you align with another person, <laughs> you have to, of course, be looking to heal yourself from colonization. So this is your understanding of abstract ideas, your thoughts, your language, right? Your, you know, ceremony, your ritual. But then when you come together with another person, you are then harmonizing with them. And we know this when we talk about toxic relationships or we talk about, you know, what happens after the wedding ceremony and we can't secure the marriage then we divorce, you know, there are so many things that still are going to overlap this emotional self, mental self, and physical self. And we really need to, um, you know, make sure that this conversation of alignment of who we are as a person holistically stays in the conversation with love, because you need to be mentally healthy in order to love yourself and love another. You need to be emotionally, you know, fluent with yourself and in, in order to be with another. And then learn that other person. And then physically, we're coming together. So when we are not healthy physically, we have those same challenges of we're going to leave our partner from the stress or we're going to dump some of those toxins <laughs> onto and into each other. So this is a major conversation of healing yourself and being on that journey. But when you come in to the relationship with another person, know that it's going to be a mutual healing still. And being able to really have the support for that, the you know expectation of that, the tools for that is extremely important because what is going to come out of you when you are with another person is going to be something else for you to heal. So there's no such thing as really in the state that we are right now coming out of um, colonization, you know, decolonizing, there's not a healed, there's not a period on the end of that sentence right. where you're saying, hey, I've done this work and I'm healed and now I'm ready for a relationship. You can definitely be on, on a healing journey by yourself, but it is going to be through the accountability of another person, through, you know, the triggers of another person, through the conversation with another person that you're going to continue to grow. That's the purpose of relationships actually is for us to, you know, continue our character development. So as you develop, you're developing in these ways, emotionally, mentally, and physically. And I think this is so important because many of us point blank are just scared. And so we use the healing um, moniker as a shield to hide our um, unpreparedness for relationships. Oh, I'm healing. I'm not in a place to be in a relationship. Or we use healing. That's some of the sisters. Some of the brothers use healing in a manipulatory way. And not all, not all either both use both, you know, use both sides of that coin. But a lot of brothers say I'm healing. So I don't want a relationship. And then when you go along with that, they want everything from you that a relationship has. <laughs> so it's like, I'm healing. So that takes a uh, full term responsibility and commitment off the table. Now let's act like we're in a relationship. But remember, I told you I'm healing. So we have to recognize that healing is perpetual, but being prepared for a relationship doesn't take years um, of your life. It takes a specific um, um, set of information from preparing for love, from mating, to courting, to finding the ideal mate, harmonizing styles, connect, uh, communicating effectively, um, resolving conflict amicably, and then um, growing together to build a love legacy through children, through our unified works and what have you, and preparing for our ascension. That doesn't take 35 years, you know, <laughs> um, 
you can actually do that very quickly when you're doing it correctly. And you know um, why we don't know this is because we're not we are not able to access our own rite of passage. So this is the challenge. We don't know right. that it doesn't take the 35 years because we really didn't get our cultural understanding and practices and values and systems in order to really be prepared right. to know ourselves and know our purpose and to align and you know unify with another. So it's important for us to be able to look for places in order to get that rite of passage, return to original knowledge, and just not not only the knowledge, because I'm saying knowledge, a lot of times when I say the word knowledge, <laughs> it comes across as information, right? True knowing is when you're doing something. Right. So a lot of times we have an access of information, but we don't actually know firsthand. And we're we're in a very fast paced culture it's time for us to recognize, I think like many indigenous cultures know now today, and they knew even thousands of years ago, is that even if you have technology, even if you have the ability to go fast in some things, it is not to your benefit as a human being. So there's some merit in slow living, in, in really being intentional and really saying to ourselves, if I go and get this knowledge, when and how, and where am I gonna implement it? And really that comes in, in with relationships because a lot of times we don't know several sources of relationship knowledge. Most people don't have a top 10 list for relationship books, right. the way that especially they do, <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially we not, not like we might for business or, you know, health for health, politics, other things. Exactly. Right. So this is a, a area of deficiency. And when you're looking to align in this way and go get the information, that's one thing. It's definitely one part of the path. Another part of the path though, is how are you going to align it for your mind, body, and spirit? And how are you going to really, you know, pull back from just getting the information and making it your personal knowledge and not just, again, something that you're doing on your self journey, but something that you can share with another person and say what you have done and what you want to do and what you're, you know, working on and what's important to you, but also be able to make sure that whoever you're interacting with, you know, your your divine partner, your spouse, you know, your soulmate, and if you have children, understanding that everyone is on that self journey and everyone needs to be practicing whatever it is that's really going to the systems that are going to work. So now we're talking about fellowship. This is big. The coming together, the interacting with each other with common accord, the unified purpose of our social um, engagements and interaction for us as black people around the world throughout the diaspora. Um, we need to have this fondness and goodwill that's in fellowship when, that when we see an African, whether they be royalty from one of the many countries that have kings and queens um, in their vocation or whether they be a lowly person who may be on hard times, homeless in the street. When we look at them, we see God or goddess and we react accordingly. This is a mentality that many of our greats have talked about and have um, given us uh, great leadership and guidance in our thinking, but it is time for us to really demonstrate this in our behavior, our daily behavior. When you see your brother and sister in the world, you should want for them the greatest parts that you want for yourself. And you should understand that we're all here um, on divine purpose and we're unique in our individuality, but we're not practicing or we won't find strength in individualism. We are a communal people. We are because I am. I am because we are. And we have to use that as a mantra and not just a, a ideological mantra, but a really um, practical mantra of daily people activity. And this, I think, in our Black community is extremely important because I think that a lot of times we lose sight of the fact, especially when it comes to love. Yes. Not so much maybe like in, I've, I've definitely heard the conversation of having a shared interest in wealth 
and having a shared interest in, you know, political ideas, even if we don't necessarily agree. I hear that conversation about let's come together on the shared interest. Right. But when it comes to love, I think that we are losing the fondness and goodwill, the friendly association with each right. other because, again, of the effects of being colonized. So this challenge of coming out of this, how do we look at each other? How do we really um, expect our friendly interaction to go as, you know, even to nation to nation, there's going to be some sense of the village where you're from. But this idea of us, you know, being at war with each other, whether it's men and women, or from colonized group to colonized group, that is a challenge. And it's definitely a byproduct of the way that we were put against each other. So there's this um, you know, umbrella of misunderstanding and conflict that is really not our own, that we need to be able to see beyond in order to really have that kind of fondness and goodwill or friendly relationship with each other. And I think it's going to be, I know for me, um, I was, I'm fortunate that I was able to have like a sister circle in the gender specific common interest and be able to, you know, have a rite of passage when I was younger, like definitely like 2021, 20, I didn't have the feeling that I couldn't get with a group of women. I didn't have the thoughts that I couldn't have sisterhood, but as I have, um, moved through life in these last 20 years, since my first experience going through Sacred Woman with Queen Afua, I definitely see that conversation as a conversation for Black women. Like, can Black women get along together in our, you know, internal village as women, but can we get along with Black men is a question. And I think that that's it's a very unique position that we're in, because I don't know how that is in other uh, communities, because I'm not in those other communities. But I definitely do not see it the way that I see it with the black men and black women or black women and black women. I don't see um, this idea of us not being able to have fellowship or women not being able to have fellowship um, be so polarizing when I watch movies or see television or, you know, just see the cultural exports again in other culture. So again, I'm not in all of those other cultures, but the way that black women are presented in the media in the, as the export again, this is the biggest thing. Like we were talking about with English, <laughs> this right, is the biz right. biggest export coming out of the United States right. is that we are the sassy, disagreeable, you know, antagonistic, violent, <laughs> violent angry. angry, bully. Bitter. And that no one can get along with us, not even our men. Right. <laughs> we can't even get along with us. Right. <laughs> you know, it, that that narrative is garbage and it proves um, irrefutably that black people don't own the media that showcases them. Mm -hmm. Because that narrative does not come from us. It's spoon fed to us. And at this point now, it's force fed to us and the rest of the world. In fact, anything that is antithetical to that narrative becomes marginalized extremely to the point where it can just be blotted out because the powers that be do not want to see black love. This is what you have to understand in all its multiplicities, whether it's brother to brother, sister to sister, brother to sister, uh, parents to children, grandparents, what have you, the idea of black love is terrifying to the rest of the world. Why? Because black love means the end of domination for those who take advantage of black people around the world. So be clear on that. When you stand up in your brotherhood, as you see me in the background here with my <laughs> initiation and my rites of passage um, that I went through over 20 years ago, um, you see that our unity is frightening to the rest of the world. And you have to understand why. So when you stand up and say, I'm for black love, however it goes, black children, black, black, black families, black um, intimate relationships, you're actually declaring a counter war against um, the systems that oppress our people historically, presently, and have plans to uh, oppress us in the future. 
So when we look at an ancient understanding of love, our Nile Valley ancestors said that love was service. You can measure love through service. And we say this commonly in a practical way. What you doing for me? What have you done for <laughs> me lately? As Janet Jackson said in the song. Um, and not in an empty, selfish way, but um, we have to ask this in a political climate. We have to ask this in a spiritual climate. We have to ask this in the various spheres of life as we interact with other people. What are you actually doing for me? And when we say me, we're not talking about the individual. We're talking about the we me, um, the me we, that, uh, that poem that Muhammad Ali gave to the world, the shortest poem in the world, um, is about black people. And it represents the the university, I mean the uni the uniform the unity without uniformity, but the collective us. What are you doing for us? As an individual black person, you know, what are you doing for your universal nation? This is a question that we should be asking of ourselves because what we do for our universal nation proves our love to that nation. Um, just simply asking what they are doing for us, you know, as President Kennedy said to the United States of America during his presidency, ask not what you can do for your country. I mean, ask not what your country could do for you, but what you could do for your country. I would emphatically say, ask not what you your your love can, I mean, ask not what your nation can um, do for you to show love, but what can you do to show love for your nation? And this is the standard that we have to hold black people to around the world now. When people stand up and talk about their greatness and their money or their influence or whatever, say, great, what are you doing to serve the, the larger black community throughout the diaspora? That is the litmus of how we um, measure your, your worth in action. And we can see here with the uh, historic Black Panther Party who serve not just black children, which was their focus, but these breakfast programs that you see this picture here um, and um, many other things they, they brought to, to the states anyway are now mainstays like WIC, Women, Infant and Children, a breakfast program, free health care. Um, you know, so we see uh, Chairman Fred Hampton here with the children. And um, this is a beautiful example of service to your community, giving something out of the love that has been poured into you. As my good friend Stacy would always say, pour in, pour in, pour in more. And I, this, you know, service is a, it, it comes back to your individual self, of course, because you should be pouring into yourself, right, on a daily basis. I know that's definitely a conversation for Black women. We have to be able to um, love ourselves, nurture ourselves, because we are also having heart attacks, right, because of the stress that we're living under in this recovery from colonization. So really being able to um, serve ourselves and then look at our partner, the people that we love, and come from a place of love to serve them. And this is really the way that you're going to serve is through recognizing your purpose and not like your purpose is separate from you. You don't have to really find your purpose, but you just have to step into it. Because we, again, don't have our right, rights of passage, we don't really have a passing down from generation to generation how to support our purpose. What happens is our caregivers don't see how to bring something out of us or how to let us shine. So a lot of times we're geared away from our purpose. And we have a conflict in that, which shows up in our loving relationships. And then other times they're just trying to protect us. So if they don't see a lane for our purpose or if we are different somehow, they don't really see how we can share. But part of you know really being able to be of service is to be in your purpose. If you are funny, if you are smart, if you have a positive outlook, a positive attitude, this is what indigenous culture says is your medicine. The reason why you are on the planet is in order to give what is unique to you to the community. So you need to do it or you will feel sick, stifled. You know, this is where some of us being toxic comes from 
but the community also needs your medicine and needs your your gifts and your purpose and for a lot of us we are our children are hurting in our communities because someone is not there to really let them shine and bring out their unique gifts. A lot of times we, especially in colonized cultures, we are still being conditioned with the language, with the holidays, with the symbolism, with the ritual, you know, with the thoughts of someone who's going against really our original self. And this happens in our family, but it absolutely happens in our school systems, in our churches, where the you know, juxtaposition is what is natural about you is actually wrong, is actually ignorant, right. is actually, you know, Ugly. of no service, did not make a contribution. And this is very challenging. Even when you're excited and courageous, naturally, you will put those things down. You will not necessarily lose them because they're always inside of you, but you will turn them off because someone is telling you that you made no contribution to the world. And this is an extremely important conversation when it comes to love, because as we said, we are uh, connected to the people who brought the first love stories, the original soulmate, and not just story, but the true existence of soulmates is a, a black story. So when we don't know this about love, when we don't know this about purpose, when we don't know this about, you know, culture, we are conditioned to think that we have nothing to offer and to be entrapped by the other person's story, right? The colonizer story. And this is really, you know, an important thing for me. I am a, an educator in every sense of the word. <laughs> I think I'm a natural educator from being an older, an older sibling, from being a nurturing kind of woman, but also literally from teaching in relationship education and other forms of education. Your job as an educator, as a caregiver, is to help guide a younger person to safely give their gift and not to, you know, um, pour the, the, you know, I don't know, extinguish the flame might be, <laughs> like just keep the child in line. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we really have to think of because it's often in our schools that we learn about Valentine's Day. It's often in our schools and, you know, in these kinds of conditions with caregivers that we find our first crushes and our first loves. And, you know, these are some of the, these stories are attached to our love story that we're, that we're creating with our whole life, how our parents got along how they talked about love, how they demonstrated what they knew again, not just the information, but the actual knowledge and wisdom that they passed down to us or didn't pass down to us. And then how we use that with our peers becomes our new social circle where we find our new love from. And it becomes the stories that we pass to our children. Yeah, I think it's just so important who's teaching our children. This picture says it all. Um, Oftentimes we look at our oppression from mean, horrible, angry men, but the damage that smiling, playful, um, gleeful and jovial women um, that are not of our cultural lineage are doing to our people is more devastating. Um, from kindergarten to PhD, we are being operated on we're being lobotomized um in a cultural sense and we're being lobotomized with a smile and a song as a mnemonic device to condition us into our own psychosis and our own effectiveness we recognize our ineptness when we come to a certain level of womanhood or manhood but oftentimes we don't look at the source being that kindergarten teacher that I was so, um, that was so beguiling to me or loved me, quote unquote, so much. Um, I often say that the purpose of education is to free you. And, in a, and that's, that's conceptually, but literally where the term comes from. But in a practical um, reality, when you're educated, you can solve your own problems. And many of these teachers claim to love these children that they, these black children that they work with, but can't help them solve the problems of their community, wouldn't be caught dead in their communities, except for when they're teaching. 
And so there's a there's a profound disingenuousness when it comes to these people. The standard of education is not about a career. It's about you solving your problems. It's about you being of value to your community and ultimately you living in your purpose. This is not hardly even talked about among these people. So either they're completely unaware, which disqualifies them, or they are um, fully aware of the damage that they're doing, which also disqualifies them. So ultimately, in decolonizing our love, we have to move to FUBU, <laughs> for us, by us, in education, in economics, in entertainment, in labor, law, fashion, food, politics, religion, sex, and war. And this is just coming back to the fact that service is really your ability to make that contribution to the welfare of another. So whether that's in your immediate intimate relationship, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your community, or whether it's offering something you know, globally as we connect from the parts of the diaspora, we really have to say that we are stepping into, we're remembering what we have to offer. And then we are, because through our fellowship, you know, through our ability to connect with each other, we're able to really contribute and make those contributions because this is extremely important. There is a lot of segmenting in our culture and in our education, in our families even, and we're not living a holistic lifestyle. So it's easy to say, I'm just going to focus on this one thing. And that will be one thing in your life, right? And it could be one thing in school. If you're just, I'm just going to focus on math. But when you don't see how things are interconnected and intimately interconnected, whether it is the subjects in school, the parts of the family, even you as your mind, body, and you know, spirit are intimately interconnected. When we don't realize that, we get spun around into something that is not, um, it's not fulfilling. It's not real in a sense. And a lot of times we don't notice that until we actually suffer the the tragedy. Something actually has to come and like break our routine or our psyche. And a lot of people don't recover from that break, right? Because it's such a shock. But if we do make it past that, sometimes we have, we're on the other side of that and we might be older. We might have already suffered the loss, right? So with that sometimes comes a, a great sense of regret. So the sooner that we can connect with purpose in a, a space that is healing and returning to what uh, our ancestors have left for us, which is not only the trauma, which is not only the, you know, the chaos or the struggle, but it's also the beginning of love, the purpose of love, the, the purpose of the individual self, the expression that we can have in all of that which is the, the holidays and the ceremonies and the rituals and the, you know, passion. When, as soon as we can return to that, we're going to be more fulfilled and we're going to be able to, you know, advance the world forward in love. Ah, shit. <laughs> so now we are at what we call the heart work. So a lot of times we use this acronym when we're talking about soul mating. The S-O-U-L stands for self, other, understanding, and legacy, or love, or love legacy. But in this heart work, now that we've talked about decolonizing love, you have some work to do, right? right? So you can think about what can you do right now? Which one of those elements of love culture can you act in today? Because that's going to be really important. There's a level of awareness that you might get thinking about, hey, I'm not going to say romantic anymore after today. <laughs> that is actually <laughs> something major. That's major because as you hear people say it, you'll be able to, you know, expand, help expand their reality also. You should cringe like me when you hear <laughs> black people say that. But then you can also think about where can you go for support. So luckily, you're listening to us and you can, you know, find that fellowship um, in the Black Love School. You can find that fellowship in other courses um, that we have. And then you can just know what it is that you're really looking to connect in any one of these areas, whether it's returning to 
a certain language, whether it's making sure that you can align your mind, body, and soul. Maybe it's, um, you know, making more intention in your ritual and in your ceremony. Once you know what you want to do, you can find a community that's focusing on that decolonizing, whether it's in spirituality, whether it's in, you know, education, whatever area of people activity, really being able to go and create fellowship is extremely important. And then of course, the other thing that you can do is to be patient. So we have to really understand, as Neely Fuller used to say, that we are all fellow victims of you know, white supremacy, colonization. And when you're seeing what you're getting back, there's a level of um, pause that you have to take. Definitely have your boundaries, but understand that we are suffering from this. As we right. talk about the, the hundreds of millions of people around the world who don't have their symbol recognition in their own language, you have to understand that that's something that's so simple, but there's a ripple effect to that. So as you're dealing in love and you're recovering and even two people claiming to really be healing, make sure that you understand that, you know, there's patience that needs to be involved. And the more that you can reach out and get support, you know, speak with someone like Mancho and I, who are really going to be able to help guide you through that, it's extremely important. This is how you're going to be able to help yourself deeper and help others. So there's an invitation to Black people around the world. Nurture your soul. Understand this acronym. Your Akoma soul is yourself and others understanding your love legacy, understanding your love systems, understanding the love art and the love science. Um, it is important for us to survive. There was a time when black consciousness was measured by empirical data. Your ability to know facts and to know languages and histories and geographic regions and peoples and tribes, etc. cetera. Um, with the advent of the information age, everybody who's uh, silly can learn a whole bunch of stuff with a, a, a search or some halfway diligent study. So it's not about information anymore. The things that measure our consciousness now, I say, uh, are in ascending order is your physical health, your, um, your labor and service to your people, which includes your, your ability to earn money and do energy exchange with Dineo, and ultimately the highest level is your relationships, your intimate relationship and your relationships with those that you love, um, be they your personal family and friends or your communal people that are all over the earth. We have to see a mirror, we have to see our people as a mirror wherever they may be, any black man, woman, or child, and we have to act accordingly in their defense, in our engagement with them. And when we do this, which is not, it is a simple task, but it's not easy. It takes some courage to do. When we do this, we can set the world back in place in a heartbeat. And this is the challenge that lies before us. We have to take heart and stand up and clean up ourselves so that we can love ourselves as if we understand ourselves divinely. And so this is what we invite you to. This is our presentation on um, decolonizing your love. This is something that we're setting out free into the world. It's in the style of one of the Black Love School classes, but we're giving it perpetually free to the world. Please share this with somebody who you think could benefit from it. And I don't think that there's any Black person on earth that couldn't find at least one or two nuggets out of this presentation. Reach out to us for deeper understanding, for more support, and to help us to join on with us to help us spread our divine purpose throughout the world, which is initiating unity through cultural love.
And on that note, we're going to say Nia Koma, which means to take heart. And until next time, Akame Akoma, Mm Akoma Womu.